Are we at Malachi 3? We at verses 7 through 9? Let's read those verses together. Even from the days of your fathers, ye are gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them. Return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye said, Wherein shall we return? Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Ye are cursed with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. For just a few moments, I want to speak from this topic, theme, or subject in the form of a question. And that question is, am I living under a curse? Am I living under a curse? You may be seated in the sanctuary. Ooh, it got real quiet in here when I called out the title of the sermon. Amen. Again, the sermon is focused on us and helping us to understand what God wants us to do and how he wants to conduct ourselves. So again, if you don't mind participating in the sermon today, look to your neighbor to the left or to your right and say, neighbor, the pastor's going to share today. Am I living under a curse? Look to somebody on the other side. And again, if you're at the wall, just speak to yourself and say, neighbor, the pastor's going to share today. Am I living under a curse? Am I living under a curse? Lord, help us today. My brothers and my sisters, the Bible lets us know what God requires of us. And here in the text, he's talking about a curse. I'm going to deal with the curse here in a little bit. But history teaches us that the pharaohs of Egypt built great pyramids to bury themselves and their possessions in when they died. Because they thought that they needed all of these possessions to help transport them into the afterlife or eternity. Again, the idea was they thought they needed those things, but didn't really have a complete understanding of what takes place after we leave this earth. Within these pyramids, there were rooms established for all of their possessions. They had a room set aside for their body or their remains. There was a space set aside for their organs because they took the organs out of the bodies when they mummified them. And even the walls had pictures on them that told the story of the Pharaoh's life and the things they accomplished while being alive. Now there have been some archeological teams that have been digging all throughout Egypt in an effort to find these quote unquote treasures that are found inside the pyramids. A website called hoaxes.org writes, and I quote, and it says, in November 1922, Howard Carter located the entrance to the tomb of Tutankhamun. We know him as King Tut. By February, he and his team had unsealed the door of the burial chamber. But a mere two months later, on April 5th, 1923, the sponsor of his expedition, Lord Carnarvon, died in his Cairo hotel room having succumbed to a bacterial infection caused by a mosquito bite. The media immediately speculated that Carnivon had fallen victim to King Tut's curse. King Tut's curse. 
This curse supposedly promised death to all who violated his tomb. Newspapers added fantastic details to their accounts of Carnivon's death, such as claiming that the lights dimmed throughout Cairo at the moment of his death. Now, this wouldn't have been surprising since power outages were almost a daily occurrence in Cairo, unquote. So they begin to say that this guy died as a result of sponsoring this expedition to get into King Tut's tomb. A curse, they said. A curse, they said. I'm trying to drive this point home. They also go on to say, and I write, they they write, and I say, many papers also claim that Carter's archaeological team had seen but chosen to ignore a warning placed above the tomb that read, death shall come on swift wings to him that toucheth the tomb of a pharaoh. But there was no such inscription, unquote. What we have here, brothers and sisters, are stories that talk about curses. But they are nothing more than stories. Did y'all catch that? A lot of the things associated with curses from a human perspective are things that people make up in their minds to be curses. Yes. I'll give you some superstitions. That's almost like proclaiming a curse. If you break a mirror in your house, what they say? So y'all heard it, seven years, bad luck. That sounds like a curse to me. They tell you, don't walk under a ladder. They say, when you're driving down the street, if a black cat comes across the road, what do you do? Stop, back up, turn around, go the other way. Because a black cat came across the street. He better be glad he got seven lives. Because there's going to come a day when somebody's not going to turn around. And that cat might get hit. You you see what I'm saying? It's all in the mind. When you have things like voodoo, Lord have mercy. They break out them chicken bones or whatever it is. And they begin to pass them around and start talking about what's going to happen. Curses all up in the mind. A lot of people associate these curses with what they have been exposed to. But I will let you know, brothers and sisters, however, You talk about driving the point home. (laughs) However, this is not the case when it comes to a curse that has been decreed by God. We saw it in the text in verse number nine. We're going to talk about it. The wrath of God and the curse of God is not a place anyone would want to endure. So we, brothers and sisters, must take the necessary steps to receive the blessings of God. And if we were to take a really good and close look at our lives right now, assess the things that are going on, look at what's happening in our lives right now, could the question be asked, am I living under a curse? Help us, Lord. Malachi was the last prophet God spoke to before the 400 years of silence leading up to the New Testament and the birth of Jesus Christ. His book, Malachi's book, covers things like the sins of Israel, commandments to the priest, Judah's hypocrisy, and the Messiah's second advent. You see, there's more to Malachi than just tithes and offerings. 
In our selected text, Malachi is dealing with the disobedience of Israel with respect to God's command to tithe and to bring him an offering. So if you don't mind, let's take a few minutes and examine what the text has for us. In verse number 7 of Malachi 3, it reads, Even from the days of your fathers, ye are gone away from mine ordinances and have not kept them. Lord, have mercy. So then he says, because of this, return unto me, and I will return unto you. Again, condition with promise. If they return, he will get in place. If we return, guess what? God will be in place. It helps us to understand that God will do what he says when we do what he commands. He says, return unto me, and I will return unto you, saith the Lord of hosts. But ye said, wherein shall we return? Return unto me. Return unto me. Look at your name and say, return unto me. me. First point today. Number one, God required repentance. Am I living under a curse? God requires repentance. In this verse, God clarified for the nation of Israel that this is not a new reason for their repentance but rather something that's been going on for some time now. The only true repentance can take place when people know they've done something wrong. He said, return unto me. Means it must have gone away. Understanding that being where God wants us to be is where we really need to be. So if we walk away, he says, return unto me. God told them that they had not kept his ordinances, his demands, his commands. He wanted them and us to be obedient to him. By definition, the word ordinances comes from the Hebrew word hok, H-O-Q, hok, which means an enactment or uh, 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 or an appointment. It's something that's appointed, something bound, something that is a commandment, a custom, a decree, something that is due. It even falls under a law, a measure, a necessary statute or task. Something that is required is what it boils down to. So the children of Israel, they knew to do right, but decided to do their own thing anyhow. Does that sound familiar? kind of like in our society today. Much like they did, the children of Israel did in the wilderness when Moses was on the mountaintop having a conversation with God and the people decided to make a molten or a golden calf. And in doing so, they turned away from God. Are y'all following me this morning? While in the dialogue, God tells Moses to go down and see what they are doing. And in doing so, God said, I will deal with them. In Exodus chapter 32, it tells us what Moses, that Moses saw the golden calf. And when he saw the golden calf, he had the tablets in his hands. The Bible calls them tables here in Exodus 32. And it says that he threw the tables down to the bottom of the mountain. And once he got down there, he put the golden calf in fire. He burned it and ground, the, uh, ground up the calf like powder. He put the powder in water, and then he made the children of Israel drink the water. Exodus chapter 32. When you get a minute, take a look at it. In Exodus 32 and 20, the Bible says, and he took the calf which they had made and burned it in the fire and ground it to powder and strawed it or threw it upon the water and made the children of Israel drink of it. Exodus 32 and 20. Then those who decided to go against God, again, because God requires repentance, those who decided to go against God were killed. Are you living under a curse? 
They were killed. And the Bible says they numbered 3,000 men. Boy, that's a mega church all by itself. 3,000 men decided to go against God. Exodus 32 and 28 says, And the children of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and there fell of the people that day about 3,000 men, living under a curse, decided to turn away from God, decided to live uh, different from God's direction and God's focus. You see, God is going to deal with disobedience. But, look at somebody and say, but. But God wants us to repent. Repent. Isn't that what uh, John the Baptist was, was proclaiming? Repent. Turn away from the world and turn to the creator of the world. He's given direction. He's given commands. He's given ordinances. And he wants us to follow them. Are we perfect? No. But we should strive to do our very best. And when we fall off, we should at least say, God, forgive me for not doing what you told me to do. Forgive me for not following your direction for my life. God, forgive me for not being the person you've designed me to be. Because again, God is requiring repentance. He wants us to repent from our disobedience of not being good stewards. We're in stewardship month, right? Let's focus in on it. From being good stewards with the resources that he has entrusted to us. Understanding that we can ask the question, am I living under a curse? So when we understand these things, they ask the question in verse number seven, wherein shall we return? Wherein shall we return? Verse 8, God begins to deal with that. He says, will a man rob God? You know, there's a difference in robbery and stealing. So you, you steal from somebody when, when you're breaking their house when they're not home. You steal from them. There's nobody there to stop you. So you go in there and you take the 75-inch flat screen. What they say, go big or go home, right? What they say? <laughs> they take all of the electronic equipment, the laptops and, and whatever else, the virtual games. They take those, they steal them. But when you rob somebody, you're looking them in the face and taking from them. And here in verse 8, the question is, will a man rob God? Help us, Lord. Yet ye have robbed me. But ye say, wherein have we robbed thee? When did we rob you, God? How, how did we rob you? How is it? I mean, you're, you're telling us that we took something from you while we were looking at you. Help us, Lord. When did we do that? He says, again, answering the question, you robbed me in tithes and offerings. You robbed me in tithes and offerings. Verse 8, second point. God identified the problem. You see, he requires repentance. They're asking the question, so what do we need to repent of? Wherein shall we return? Wherein shall we begin to do those things? What is it you want us to do specifically? He tells them, you robbed me and tithes and off. He identifies the problem for them. Let me ask a question. Does anybody here remember the television show, Different Strokes? 
It was a story about two African-American kids adopted into a, a Caucasian household. And the youngest of the two kids, they were both boys, was the comedian. There's a comedian in every family. Somebody always cracking jokes, somebody always making people laugh. There's always a comedian. So Willis, who was the older kid, would make a statement about something, whatever the, the conversation was about. And Arnold wouldn't always understand what Willis was saying or didn't want to really take in what Willis was saying. And so he would always ask the question, what you talking about, Willis? <laughs> what you talking about, Willis? Think about this. Wherein have we robbed thee? Wherein have we robbed thee? Can you see the children of Israel asking that question to God? That question is, what you talking about, God? Think about that. Wherein have we robbed thee? And God made it plain to them and told them they robbed him in tithes and offerings. The first offering recorded in scripture is found in Genesis chapter 4, dealing with Cain and Abel. And the first evidence of tithing and the first mention of tithing takes place in Genesis chapter 14. And both of which were practiced before the law was given. Again, we talked about it on last week, how there are some people who say, well, I don't need to tithe now because we're under grace. We're no longer under the law, and therefore we don't need to tithe anymore. But we see here the Bible has established for us that the tithing principle and command, if you will, started long before the law was given concerning tithing. God commanded the tithe in Deuteronomy chapter 27, in Numbers chapter 18, in 2 Chronicles chapter 31, and also in Nehemiah chapter 10. So the children of Israel knew what was required of them. And again, bringing the tithe to God does not make him richer. Did y'all catch that? Bringing the tithe to God does not make him richer since everything already belongs to him. Can I put a bookmark right there? Bringing the tithe to God's house does not require somebody to have the understanding that somebody in the church is going to benefit from it. What am I trying to say? All right, y'all want, want me to be real today? I'll be real today. I'm not taking my money to the church because the pastor going to get it all. Unfortunately, that mindset is throughout Christendom. And there are a lot of people who are missing out on the blessings of God because of some perception within God's house. And I've said before that our giving is between us and God. If the deacon make you mad, Well, my deacon didn't call me this month, so I'm not going to bring my tithe. Mm. If the pastor doesn't call out your name for something, well, I'm not going to bring my tithe because I'm mad at the pastor. Newsflash. When that mentality goes out, your problem is not with the deacon or the pastor. Your problem is now with God because he's identified the problem and now we have to get back in line with God. Again, giving to God does not make him richer, but it does make us richer. I need y'all to hear me today because in doing so, God always honors our obedience and when we do that, the blessings of God are promised to us. 
We just have to get in line, get in obedience with God. And let me, let me go on record and say this real quickly. We should not tithe because of the promised blessings from God. Should I say that again? Let me say it again. We should not tithe because of the promised blessings from God. But we should tithe because we want to be obedient to God. Because again, God always blesses our obedience. The bottom line here still applies. The bottom line, then, now, applies that since the tithe belongs to God, None of us have the right nor the authority to give his tithe to anything or anyone else. If I loan you some money, think about it. When God puts it in our hands, it's really on loan to us. He's looking for us to manage it for him. If I loan you some money, you don't take my money and give it to Deacon Kelly. <laughs> well, I asked Deacon Kelly to give the money to you. No, wrong answer. Wrong answer. The, the principle here is, if it belongs to God, we don't have a right to give it to somebody else. We have to give it back to God. Because I'm sure if you loan something to somebody else, you want it yours back, and you don't want them to give yours to somebody else. Man, can I borrow your car? Sure, no problem. I'll bring it back. I'll just remember, when you bring it back, it's got to have the same amount of gas in it that it has in it right now when you bring it back. It's got to be back by a certain time. Okay, we got the agreement. We got the ordinance. Mm. We got the command. We got the decree. We got the understanding. Five o'clock come when my car is supposed to be back. I'm calling. Hey, man, where's my car? Oh, I'm done with it. I gave it to so-and-so. Nah, dude, wrong answer. Wrong answer. You're supposed to bring it back to me. Because that was the agreement. Deuteronomy chapter 27, Numbers chapter 18, 2 Chronicles chapter 31. <laughs> Lord, have mercy. We see in all of these where God has told them, this is what I want. Nehemiah 10 was the other one. God had laid it out. All he wanted them to do was obey it and bring it back to him. So we don't have a right to take what belongs to God and give it to somebody else. We give it back to God because God wants it done that way. And if I can help us just a little bit, we have to understand that we don't bring a partial tithe to God either. He says, bring ye all the tithe. So he wants us to bring back all of it. Look at somebody and say, all of it. So understanding that when we give, we want to be obedient. And in our obedience, we want to give everything back to God that belong to God. Amen? I'm almost through. I'm almost through. Here's what happened to the children of Israel, and the principle is real concerning their disobedience to God, found in verse number nine. He says, ye are cursed with a curse. That's rough, y'all. For ye have robbed me. Look me in the face and took from me. We might be thinking to ourselves today, how is it that we can possibly rob God? 
every time we give to God. If it's not what he requires, we're robbing God because he's everywhere. Even the scripture this morning quoted by Olivia said the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. So when you understand even that verse of scripture, well, let me ask this question. Who are the righteous? Come on, who are the righteous? The ones, amen, Christians, we are. The ones who have accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. We're the righteous. So every time we deal with God in this area, it tells us that God is there watching. The eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. When you go to the book of Luke, you find that Jesus was standing while they were giving. And he saw those who gave out of abundance. But he also saw that poor widow who gave everything she had, the two mites. Check this out. How is it that Jesus knew how much they gave and how much she gave? Amen. He's omniscient. He's all-knowing. So he knew how much they were giving, meaning those who gave out of their abundance, and the poor widow woman who gave the two mites. So here, we ask the question, well, how do we rob God? Well, guess what? He's watching. Well, I can't give the tithe today because, you know, God understands. He knows my heart. Lord, have mercy. We got to be very careful making that statement because God does know our hearts. We know what the tithe is, but we also saw something on sale. I'm just going to let that sink in. God knows my heart. Yeah, he does. He definitely does. So what we've got to do is understand that when we are giving, he's watching. He knows. He calls it robbery because it deals with looking him in the face and not being obedient. And if we're not bringing the whole tithe to God, that's what we're doing. We're robbing God. Look down in verse number nine. He says, you curse with a curse, for ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. Their disobedience is out there. Now God is dealing with their disobedience. Third and final point is I hurry to a close. Number three, God proclaimed the curse. God proclaimed the curse. This is definitely a message to help our understanding. And I sure hope you're able to scream hallelujah when we get done with it. Because if God is helping us in our understanding, we should be screaming hallelujah. So here in verse 9, now God tells them the consequence of their disobedience by proclaiming a curse on them. A curse on them. The original Hebrew word for curse is the word miera. M-E apostrophe E-R-A, miera. And it means an execration, to be disobedient. It means to protest vehemently against. Did y'all catch that? It means to just outright say no. Bring ye the tithe, all the tithe, into the storehouse. No! vehemently against. It means to, uh, de to denounce or to abhor. What God was basically saying was that because they were not obeying him and meeting his expectations of them, he was in turn not 
obligated to extend the same levels of blessings and prosperity to them as before. What does that mean? God is not going to bless their disobedience. And he's not going to bless ours either. He's not going to bless our disobedience. How many parents bless their children, reward their children for being bad, for doing bad, for acting up? Kid goes out there, get in trouble with the law. You get him home. And as soon as you get home, he says, okay, you know what? I'm going to buy you a car tomorrow. Most parents don't do that. They don't reward their children for their disobedience. And the truth of the matter is, God is not blessing folks in the midst of disobedience as well. There's nothing new under the sun, brothers and sisters, and God had already dealt with them concerning their disobedience. He dealt with them all the way back in the book of Leviticus. God had already proclaimed the blessings on them for obeying him and for keeping his commandments. And again, because God is a God of balance, he also told them what would happen if they were not obedient to him. Y'all still with me this morning? In Leviticus chapter 26, just so we all know what was taking place. In Leviticus chapter 26, Verses 14 through 17, here's what God said to them. He says, but if ye will not hearken unto me, will not listen to me, will not hear what I'm saying, and will not do all these commandments, he says, and if ye shall despise my statutes, or in your soul abhor, that sounds familiar, abhor my judgments, so that ye will not do all my commandments, commandments, but that ye break my covenant. He's identifying him. If you don't want to do what I've told you to do, I'm, here it is, I'm telling you what I want. And if you don't want to do it, in verse 16 he says, I also will this unto you. I'll do this unto you. I will even appoint over you terror, consumption, and the burning agoo that shall consume the eyes and cause sorrow of heart. And ye shall sow your seed in vain, for your enemies shall eat it. And I will set my face against you. See, right there, we need to repent. He's going to bring all of this stuff down. Then he says he's going to turn his face against us. Lord, help him. Lord, help us. And then he says, and ye shall be slain before your enemies. That they hate you, they that hate you, I'm sorry, shall reign over you. And ye shall flee when none pursueth you. I will appoint over you terror, consumption. What does that mean? It means taking away. See, most people in America are consumers. We, we, we're not producing anything, we're taking. Here he says consumption, meaning I'm going to have things taken away from you. I'm going to have things pulled from you. That causes uh, and that shall consume your eyes and cause sorrow of your heart. See, we've got to understand, brothers and sisters, that the commandment and the covenant and the principle of God is primarily that of obedience. Obedience. And God is expecting our obedience in all areas and aspects of our lives. That includes also the area of stewardship and bringing God his tithe and his offerings. I don't know about you, brothers and sisters, but I don't want to be walking around 
living under a curse. I recognize that I am not perfect. And neither are you. Y'all looking at me like, oh, Pastor, you ain't perfect. No, I ain't perfect. I ain't been saved all my life. Amen. And I'm still just as human as the next person. But I'm trying. Hmm. One song said, Lord, I'm running. Trying to make 100. 99 and a half won't do. I don't want to live under a curse because I'm only achieving 99 and a half. I wish I had a witness today. Again, I don't know about you, but I don't want the terror of God to show up in my life. Lord, have mercy. I don't want what I've been blessed with to be consumed from me. Hello, somebody. I don't want to be sick and have chills and, and, and a fever like, like I'm in trouble in my body. COVID is just like that to some degree. I don't want to have that in my life. I don't want to be walking and living under a curse. I know I'm getting a little bit older, but I still want to make sure I can see. I don't want my eyes consumed. I'm not talking about the text here. I don't want my eyes consumed. And Lord have mercy, I don't want sorrow in my heart. I don't want sorrow in my heart. How many people want to feel sorrowful every day? That is no way to live. So what do we do? We do those things that are pleasing to God so that we don't have these things showing up in our lives, having us living under a curse. Text even goes on to say, I don't want my, I don't want to sow my seeds and, and have my enemies benefit from it. That's right there in the text. He said, you sow your seeds and those folks who are your enemies who don't like you, they're the ones who benefit from it and not you. Because of the curse. Because of the curse. And Lord have mercy. I do not want God to turn his face against me. Somebody once said the safest place is in the will of God. And when you find yourself in the will of God, he won't turn his face against you. Why? Because you're operating in the obedience of God. But I also believe, brothers and sisters, I also believe that God doesn't want to curse us because he sent Jesus to save us. And so that we don't have to endure that eternal damnation, Jesus was the one who became a curse for us. It's in the word of God, brothers and sisters. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13, the Bible says, Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us. For it is written, curse is everyone that hangeth on a tree. You see, the curse of God that should be on us was found on Jesus Christ because he became the curse for us that we through him might have everlasting life. And we've got to recognize that doing it the way God wants it done ensures the blessings of God on our lives. There is, if you will, no negotiation here. Help us, Holy Ghost. When he says all, he means all. Because guess what? Jesus became all the curse for us when he hung on that tree. And he hung on a tree called Calvary's cross to redeem us. 
to turn us back to God. And of course, we know they drove nails in his hands, nails in his feet, put a crown of thorns on his head, pierced him in the side so that, check this out, we wouldn't be cursed. Somebody ought to say hallelujah right there. So that we wouldn't be cursed. And the Bible says he died on that tree. They took him off the tree and put him in a borrowed tomb. And early on Sunday morning, he got up with all power in his hands so that we wouldn't have to live under a curse. We now have everlasting life through him, but it still requires us to be obedient. It requires us to be uh, the people that God has called us to be. It requires us to operate under the command and the ordinances of God. And in order for us to do so, we have to know Jesus Christ for ourselves. We've got to accept him as Lord and Savior because as we begin to operate under the ordinances of God. The Bible says the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous. So every day, we've got to strive. Look at somebody and say strive. We've got to strive to live according to the word of God. We've got to strive to know Jesus Christ better. We've got to strive to increase in our relationship with the Lord so we don't find ourselves asking the question, am I living under a curse? One song we used to sing back in the day was a song that tied into our relationship with the Lord. And the song goes, Jesus, keep me near the cross. Y'all remember that song? Jesus, keep me near the cross. Why do we want to be near the cross? Because there is blessings for us at the cross. And when we understand that staying close to the cross of Jesus, if you will, helps us to stay close to Jesus. I'm not a song person, meaning I can't sing songs, because y'all know my, my notes are like way out there. But that song is on my heart. And, and I believe, I believe it'll help us in understanding this whole curse thing. Because let me help somebody here. Jesus is bigger than any curse. And when we're operating in him, he shows us how he's able to bless us. Will y'all help me sing this song? I, I don't know all of it. I just know that first part that everybody knows. Something like this. Jesus, keep me near the
my Lord, rest beyond the river. Y'all sound so good. We'll sing that again.